take your Bibles with me on this resurrection Lord's Day and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Sometimes it works out. I'm preaching through a, a book and I don't have to break stride, but uh, that didn't, didn't happen this year. I'm preaching through John's Gospel. I invite all of you folks who might not have a church home when you're here for the first time, uh, come back. Next week, Pastor Rick will preach to us from 1 Peter, but then we will launch right back into that for the rest of the month of April, back into John's Gospel, and we've come uh, to John 19, the crucifixion of Jesus. So we'll just continue thinking about our crucified, buried, risen Savior for many, many weeks ahead. Uh, in John's Gospel. So I invite you to, to come back for that and come back next week uh, to hear from Pastor Rick. Today, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 8 through 13. And there the Holy Spirit of God, through the Apostle Paul, says these words, Remember... Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, being bound in chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too might obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This saying is trustworthy. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. Because he cannot deny himself. This is the word of God. Lord, speak to us now through your word. Fill us with your spirit. God, these people don't need me today. They don't need my eloquence. They need you, Lord Jesus. They need an inbreaking of your spirit, O oh God, to transform their hearts and give them new hearts if they've never repented of their sin and trusted in Christ. Oh God, they need you to break into their lives. To give them new hearts, new minds, to make them men and women of repentance, of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. We need you, oh God, to help us, to give us grace today that we might remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. We'll do this for your sake, O oh God. Amen. Remember. Remember. It's such a powerful word, isn't it? Even in the English. It's very powerful. And this word has served entire nations as a rally cry, including our own, has it not? Remember the Alamo. It was a rally cry for our nation at a point in our history. Remember the Alamo. After 9-11, we often heard the refrain, we will never forget. Well, that's just another way, isn't it, of saying, remember. We must remember. In the holidays like this one, we call it Easter, they often serve as times of remembrance. Truth be known, and as a pastor over the years, I have repeatedly been reminded that Holidays are not always happy days for many people who are sitting and listening to me. Many people around you today, some of you are here and this might not be 
the happiest occasion for you because your memories of lost loved ones are painful and you're battling those today. You may be here and you're remembering missed opportunities. Many of us missed an opportunity yesterday to go meet 120 of our neighbors. We announced it for weeks, but many of you, most of you, I'm not trying to beat you over the head, I'm just saying. Sometimes these occasions called holidays, the memories aren't so great. When it comes to memories, I want you to know we always have a choice of how we will remember and of what we will remember. Now I know sometimes memories kind of just float in and out of our minds at random. But by and large, what I said to you is true. Even when they float into your mind, you then still have a choice. How are you going to respond to that memory? How are you going to remember? What are you going to remember? We can remember in ways that actually drive us to despair and cause us to push others away. I suspect you've all done it. I certainly have. We can remember in ways that will lead us to self-medicate or, God forbid, even self-harm. We can even remember in ways that, if we're not careful, might deter, uh, turn the, the deceased loved one or the memory itself into an idol of sorts. It's just consuming us. But we can also choose to remember, by God's grace, the good, the merciful, the delightful, the joyful. Amen? Amen. We can remember the laughter, the smiles, the hugs, the kisses, all of the kindnesses of God that came to us through whatever uh, we're remembering, whether it's just an occasion or a person. We can celebrate God's grace to us in the past, and we can remember in ways that will produce gratitude in us and joy in us. And when we remember that way, it's life-giving, isn't it? You see, it's all in how we remember and in what we remember. And God says, through Paul, to a young pastor named Timothy, and because of his grace in preserving his word to all of us today, remember Jesus Christ. Remember, that means to intentionally call to mind. Again, some memories might just kind of seem random, floating in and out of our minds, but that's not what the Apostle Paul has in view here. This command in the Greek is a present imperative, and so it means I want you, Timothy, to constantly pay attention to, to purposely never stop thinking. It's an intentional process that's being commanded of us. Bring to the forefront of your mind over and over. Never stop thinking about. Never stop remembering. Keep thinking and considering Jesus Christ. Now, you might think that Timothy, a Christian pastor, does he really need to be told to remember Jesus Christ? If you're a Christian here, do you really need to be told, commanded by God to remember Jesus Christ? Yes. Amen, Pastor. You better believe you do, and I do, and we do. Beloved pastor from yesteryear, John Stott, said this, quote, The human memory is notoriously fickle. It is possible to forget even one's own name, end quote. And well, that's just true, isn't it? You see, our minds, like our bodies, to stay healthy, they, they must be exercised. We must be renewed, Paul says to the church at Rome, in our minds. And we need God's sustaining grace even upon our minds, just as we do our bodies. Right? 
the old covenant people of God. In the biggest part of your Bible, if you're new to this, the Old Testament. You start reading the Old Testament and you will hear God say to Israel, his old covenant people, over and over and over again, remember, remember, don't forget how I rescued you with my strong and mighty arm from slavery and bondage. And don't forget to pass down that memory of who I am, that I'm your Redeemer, your God, your Savior. I've called you by name and called you my child. Don't forget, and then don't you let your children forget. And don't you let your children's children forget. Over and over again, in my yearly reading plan right now, I'm in Deuteronomy. It's full of exhortations. Don't forget. Remember. And you know, it's also full of prophecy where God told them, you're going to forget. As we say in the Marine Corps, when you get fat and happy, right? That's, I'm paraphrasing. That's my Keith McWhorter Marine Corps paraphrase of Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 8, where God repeatedly says, you're going Israel, you're going to get fat and happy because I'm going to bless your socks off. I'm looking at people whose socks are blessed off. Travel a little bit around the world if you don't believe that. You're going to get fat and happy, God said, paraphrasing, and you're going to forget. And worse than that, he says, you're going to think you did this. That you made yourself great. That you made yourself rich. God warned them repeatedly, don't forget, but they did. The psalmist in Psalm 78, 11 says this. They forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. So I'm urging you today, remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. Paul's outline here is very easy to follow in 2 Timothy. Everything flows out of that command. Remember Jesus Christ, who he is, his person, and what he did, his work. Remember who he is and what he did, what he is doing, and what he will do. That's Paul's outline. You can follow it very easily yourself. Remember, he says, Jesus. That's his given birth name, if you will, right? As a human baby boy. But not just human. Because this baby boy was conceived of the Holy Spirit of God in the womb of a virgin named Mary. And he was born of that virgin named Mary. Jesus, Yeshua. The name means Yahweh saves or the Lord saves or the Lord is salvation. He is his name. He is salvation. He is Yahweh the Savior. Remember, Yeshua, Jesus, he saves. He's the God who is salvation. Remember, Jesus, Christ. You still following me? I know this is a complex outline. You still with me? You awake? Remember, Jesus, Christ. Christos, Hebrew, Mashiach, Messiah. Christ, Messiah, same word, just two different languages. The Christ is the anointed one of God. He's the chosen king to rule God's kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed, the chosen king of God's everlasting kingdom. He's the one that God promised in the Old Testament to send through David's lineage, King David. This is why Paul says he's the offspring of David. He's the son of David. The Messiah, the promised king of God's everlasting kingdom was to come through David. Every self-respecting Jew down through the ages has known that God promised King David that his throne would endure forever and that one of his sons would sit upon that throne Forever and ever. 
And God kept that promise by sending the offspring of David, Jesus Christ. Just in case you and I want to try to box Jesus in to the merely human category, which already Jesus Christ, the offspring of David, wouldn't allow you to do that if you know your Bibles well. But even if you tried to do that at this point, nah. Risen from the dead. Remember, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. The offspring of David. Don't disconnect those two. You might be wondering, what do those two have to do with one another? The resurrected, risen son of David. Those are not disconnected things, not even in the Old Testament, I'll have you know. Many of the promises of God concerning the coming Messiah and the kingdom of God in this world and over the universe, many of those Old Testament promises were couched in resurrection language. Do you know this? The resurrection of David and his kingdom is predicted and prophesied. Let me give you just one example. There are many, but let me give you just one from the prophet Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel was prophesying hundreds and hundreds of years after the king named David died. David's long gone when Ezekiel was on the scene. But listen what God prophesied through Ezekiel in chapter 37, verses 24 and 25. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. My servant David will be their prince forever. Do you see it? David's been dead hundreds of years. Some Jews, even to this day, the first time I was ever in Israel, 1999, if memory serves me, and I took a, a tour with a, a secular tour guide and was asking him curious questions about what he thought about Jesus and the historicity and the reliability of the events surrounding his life. And we went to King David's tomb and I, I saw the Jewish people there bowing down and it looked to me as if they were worshiping. And I asked the tour guide, are they, are they, what, are they, what are they doing? It's the second holiest site in all of Judaism today, King David's tomb. And he said, well, many of them believe that David will be resurrected to be the Messiah. Or there's another way to see it. It's, the Old Testament is very, very uh, normal, if I can put it that way, for people to be called in the Old Testament by the name of their greatest ancestor. So Irish knew this. I'm Irish. I'm from Clan Buchanan. That Buchanan guy must have been something. Everybody got called by his name, whether my name's not literally Buchanan. But that would be how I'd be known back in those days. That's my clan. I'm a Buchanan. And it worked the same way in the Old Testament. You can see that how uh, David would kind of name all of his descendants. So the promise that David, my servant David, will be king over them. My servant David will be the one shepherd. My servant David will be their prince. How long? Forever, God said. Now Jesus picked up this very language in John chapter 10, for example. He said, I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep, not of this fold, and I must bring them too, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. And Jesus went on to say, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay my life down so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I have power to lay it down on my own initiative, and I have power to take it up again. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, the offspring of David. Hallelujah. He prophesied his own death and resurrection. Now, you might do that, but you, you're not going to pull it off, I assure you. No one had pulled it off until Jesus. Some of you might be thinking that Pastor Brandon and I coordinated our messages. If you came to the sunrise service, we didn't. I told him what I was preaching. He told me what he was preaching, and God planned it. What a, what a sermon you missed if you didn't get up early this morning, by the way. 
from Acts chapter 2. That David could not possibly be the fulfiller of all these messianic promises because he's lying a moldering in the grave. And so were all the other Davidic kings. Remember, therefore, Jesus Christ risen from the dead, the seed, the offspring, the son of David. This is why in the New Testament, Jesus is not just called David's son. He is David's Lord and he is David's root. He fulfills every messianic promise God has ever or will ever make. Now, think carefully with me about being raised from the dead. The Greek here is literally, remember Jesus Christ, having been raised out of the dead ones. It's a perfect tense. It means he definitively in the past was raised up out of the realm of the dead ones. And he stands risen. Still true today. Still having impact today. He stands risen. He's forever risen. He's always risen. Remember Jesus Christ. Having been raised out of the dead ones. That means he died. He was buried. And he rose. And he's risen. And he's alive today. And Paul says this is what is preached in my gospel. Remember all this, he says, who Jesus is, what he did, as preached in my gospel, in my good news. This is the good news Paul announced across the Roman Empire, isn't it? Paul summarized his gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. You want to know the gospel Paul preached in a nutshell? Here it is, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures now i do not intend to spend much time defending the reality and the trustworthiness and the reliability of jesus resurrection today i have done that quite a bit in the past you can go find the sermons on our website i've given a whole Lessons and sermons on the historical reliability of this event we call the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So today I just want to tell you, go ahead and research it for yourself. The truth can bear your scrutiny. The truth can bear any reasonable test put upon it. The resurrection of the man Jesus who was crucified and sealed in a Roman tomb in Jerusalem about A.D. 30. It is as verifiable a fact of antiquity as there is on the planet. If you can't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, you cannot believe any other purported fact in all of antiquity. The evidence is that strong. It is absolutely irrefutable by any reasonable standard. Are you hearing me? The eyewitness accounts that we call the New Testament, in case you're wondering about them, they have absolutely been tested in every way any ancient document would and proven to be light years beyond anything else. They are so much more trustworthy, so much more accurate, so much more reliable. What I am saying to you, friends, is that you have no good reason to doubt that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. You don't have any good reason. You might have reasons that are spiritual. But you don't have reasons based on evidence. Listen, if you leave here today and you still doubt that Jesus is risen from the dead, come see me. I'd love to talk to you and spend time with you. But if you leave here and you're just rejecting that, you're just saying that, I reject that. I want to tell you, it's not an intellectual problem you have. You know how I know that? Because of Paul's gospel which is God's gospel. Your problem, the gospel that Paul preached says, your problem and my problem is spiritual. We're spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. You know what you need? You need a resurrection. 
You need God to raise your dead heart from the grave of its depravity and its sin. You need God to reach down in grace by the power of His Spirit and rip the sinful scale off your blind eyes and show you the glory of Christ so you can remember Him risen from the dead. The offspring of David has preached in this gospel. Right now, I'm preaching the same gospel Paul preached. Our problem is spiritual. I have every confidence, however, that if you will just begin to read your Bible, and we'd love for you to find somebody in this church to do that with you. Just stand and start reading your Bible. Thinking about what God says. Just keep reading it. Just keep reading it. Just keep reading it. You know, I have great confidence that if you do that and you keep sitting under good gospel preaching and teaching, you have every advantage needed to become one who delights in the memory of Jesus Christ risen from the dead. You know how I know that? Because the word of God is not chained. Paul said, I'm willing to suffer anything for this gospel. Because it's the power of God, he told Rome, unto salvation to everyone who believes. The word of God is not chained. You chain Paul, you can behead Paul. You can't chain or behead the gospel word of God. It's still saving sinners. Jesus is alive and His Word is alive. This gospel is the good news of how a holy God has made a way for unholy sinners like us to be put right with God now and forever. And He's done that through the righteous life, the substitutionary death, and the powerful resurrection and the ascension back to the Father of Jesus Christ, the offspring of David, risen from the dead. You remembering him today? Do you understand how sinful you are? This is the gospel Paul preached. It's the gospel I preach. It's the gospel of God that he's given us in the scripture. Do you understand how much you have to have Jesus? His righteousness standing and pleading before God in your place? Have you lied? Everybody in here who can talk, I already know the answer. If you're old enough to have had deceptive thoughts, I already know the answer. God is a pure, perfect, holy, righteous lawgiver. His law reflects His character. And He says, do not lie. Because he's a God who is true, only true, always true. And so it defames his good character when we deceive and we lie. Like, well, lying's not that bad. A little white lies. That's what we do. That's not what God does. No, no, God's standard, he's absolutely holy and perfect and righteous and just. And his standard is holy, righteous, just, perfect, pure, sinless perfection. He will not dip that standard. If he does, now he's like you and me and we're all doomed. God is holy and just. Do you understand that? So just, I'm only giving you one law that we've all broken. Lying. We've actually broken every law God's ever given. Don't believe me? Start reading your Bible. Just that one You know what the Bible says about liars? All liars will have their part in the lake of fire. Okay, you might say, well, that seems awfully harsh. Well, God didn't ask your opinion. He didn't ask mine either. He's the judge. His standard is don't lie ever for any reason, and we all have. Do you see what kind of trouble you're in if you meet this God today, if you were to leave this life? And you're standing on your own merits. You're standing on your own. Oh, I think maybe God will just give me a break on judgment day. Uh, maybe I'll be having a good day and he'll sweep all my sin under the rug. And No, he's perfectly just. That means every sin gets paid for, gets its due. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. His righteousness. He came and lived a sinless life in our place. He did what we could not and would not because of our sin and our depravity. And He presented Himself on the cross 
as a pleasing, sinless sacrifice in our place. And he rose to prove he is who he says he is. Jesus Christ risen from the dead, the offspring of David. And he's alive today. And he still saves sinners today who will call upon his name. Who will run to him for mercy. Paul said he's willing to endure anything for this gospel. He's willing because he knows God still has chosen people out there that he intends to save. Listen, the doctrine of election or God choosing those he was going to save does not discourage evangelism. Sure didn't with Paul. I'll endure anything, he said. To preach and proclaim this gospel. Why? Because when I do, God saves sinners. I don't know who the elect are. Only way I know, go tell them the gospel. When they repent and believe, you're like, hallelujah, God had another chosen one out there. Isn't that amazing? It, Paul's confidence, you see, is not in himself. It's not in his eloquence. It's not in his evangelism strategy or his gospel tract or booklet or cookie cutter method. I'm not against any of that, by the way. I'm just telling you that Paul's confidence was that Jesus is the Savior, risen from the dead, and therefore he can give life because he's alive. His word is alive. It's not bound. It's free. Jesus Christ saves sinners. And when he does, right, Paul says this salvation is in Christ Jesus. And it's going somewhere. Do you see it? It comes with eternal glory. It's going somewhere when Jesus saves a sinner. When a sinner turns from his sin and renounces all of his own goodness and his own sense of self-righteousness and whatever it is that you think is going to get you in there, when you just renounce all that and you say, I am going to remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, the offspring of David. I'm going to be saved in Jesus Christ. It comes with eternal glory, full resurrection, bodily glory, just like Jesus will be made like him. 1 John chapter 3 says, Jesus told his disciples in John 14, 19, because I live, you will live also. Well, that's an amazing promise. You want to claim that by faith today? I'm urging you to. Jesus said, when he, before he raised Lazarus from the dead, he said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he die, yet shall he live. You see the promise of Jesus? Everlasting life that's leading to eternal glory. Your sins forgiven forever as far as the east is from the west. The very life of God in Christ and life with God in Christ. That's the promise. And I'm here to tell you Jesus has the power to keep the promise. Why? Because he's Jesus Christ. Risen from the dead. I'm not preaching a dead person to you today. I don't get this excited about dead people. I've, I miss many, many heroes and loved ones in my family, but I don't get this excited about dead people. Paul stood before people of Athens, Greece. The same apostle that's Encouraging Timothy, remember Jesus Christ. And in Athens, Greece, he said this, that God is now commanding all people everywhere to repent, to have a changed heart and mind, to turn from sin and trust God. That's what repent means. God, he says, has commanded all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man he has appointed. And of this he has given proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. Acts 17, 30 and 31. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. This is a trustworthy saying. Paul says there is a power and a promise in remembrance. If we remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, as presented in the gospel, as given to us in the word of God, 
There's power and there's promise for now and forever. Paul can't talk about the everlasting glory that's coming to those who Jesus has saved by his grace. He can't talk about it without bursting into song or at least poem. Verses 11, 12, and 13, definitely a poem, probably an early hymn of the church. If we have died with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. See, the power and the promise, saving faith in Jesus Christ is not anemic. It is not a, oh, I just sprinkle Jesus over my filthy, sinful, in depravity, in bondage to sin, can't seem to whip sin at all. Sin just keeps getting the number on me every day. I just keep living like I always live. No, 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 that's not salvation in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. No, those who are truly saved die with Christ. Paul says in Romans 6, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We've been raised with him because we died with him. Our old man is gone, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Old things have passed away. Amen, Christian brother or sister. You have any resonance with this? We are not powerless anymore against sin in our heart and our life. We're not slaves to it anymore. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Because you're under grace, he says. Romans 6. And here, he says, if we've died with him, we die to our sin daily. and We will live with him now and forever, I believe he means. There's a power for today and it results in a promise being kept by his power in the future. Life that is Death defying in Christ Jesus. Death doesn't get the final word. Jesus lives forever. Because he's alive, he strengthens and upholds those who trust in him, who remember him, who follow him. He gives us strength, doesn't he, to endure in the faith. That's what Paul says next. If we endure, if we buck up under any hardship or suffering, We will also reign with him. What a promise. I'm looking out at a bunch of people. If you're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and you are remembering Jesus Christ risen from the dead and you have experienced the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I know some of you, most of you, you're looking back at me thinking the same thing. Don't look like much. Future Prince and princesses, that's all we're looking at. (coughs) Reigning forever and ever with the Lord Jesus Christ as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The resurrected reigning life is what Jesus promises. Oh, listen, (laughs) that grieving Christian widow, I know she doesn't look like much now. She has a future and a hope that will outshine the sun. I I know that that pastor being beaten by an angry Muslim mob, he looks pitiful now. But soon and very soon, he'll stand beside Jesus in everlasting victory and he will radiate the refulgent regal majesty and splendor of his king and his Lord with eternal glory, I'm telling you. Listen, I I know our broken churches that are far too often full of bitterness and backbiting. I know they don't look very impressive right now. The churches who do try to look impressive I think in God's view are the least impressive. But I tell you, one day Jesus will make good on his promise. He's going to present his bride to himself. Pure and holy and unblemished and unstained and undefiled. I tell you, look around you, Christian brothers and sisters. We're not going to recognize one another on that day. 
We'll be so full of the brightness and the light and the glory of Jesus. We'll be like, what? who are you? I've never seen anyone, I've never seen anything so beautiful as the bride of Christ on that day with the light of the groom in her eyes. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. This is our hope. This is our future. As you remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, you you begin to rejoice in who He's made you now, but you also begin to really long for, don't you? Who you know you will be in Him one day. Anybody anybody with me? Anybody say, come Lord Jesus quickly. Now listen, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that the gospel, though it comes with all of these grand promises that will be kept because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, it also comes with warnings. See the flip side of the coin. If we deny him, he will deny us. That's exactly what Jesus said, by the way, in Matthew 10. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. If we're unfaithful, if we're faithless, if you depart this life, listen, I don't care if you're 19 years old or you're 90 years old. If you walk out of here, and God forbid... I don't like having to say these things, but I also know that your next breath is never guaranteed. Young and old people die every day by the millions. Do you know this? If you depart this life in a state of denying Jesus Christ risen from the dead, in a state of no faith, faithless, without faith, God will not deny Himself. He's always true to His character. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is faithful to judge sin. Every sin will be judged by God. Please hear me. Every sin will be judged by God. Either in the body of the sinner in hell or in the body of Christ on the tree. I want you to know the joy of knowing your sin's already been judged. It's already been paid for in full. And that therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm urging you, know Jesus today as your Savior. Remember Him as the risen Savior and Messiah and King and Lord. Call out to Him for mercy today. And you'll never have to meet Him or know Him as your judge because he was judged in our place this is who we're being told to remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead the offspring of David as preached in my gospel let's pray Lord please have mercy please have mercy on every man, woman, boy, and girl within the sound of my voice. Turn their hearts, O God, away from their sin. Give them an unquenchable desire to drink from the fountain of life that is Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Save sinners today as only you can, Lord Jesus. I pray in your name. Amen.